Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between or outside of those two. I am a cisgender homosexual male. Within that sentence is the framework for my sexual identity, my biological sex, my gender, and my sexual orientation or sexuality. A lot of people don't realize that gender, sex, and sexuality are three completely independent factors affecting an individual, or that gender is far more complex in identity than the binary of male and female that we popularly hear. Let me break it down. Your sex depends on what you have. Your genitals, your chromosomes, it is about your body. Your sexuality depends on who you think you like that is, others and their bodies. Your gender depends on who you think you are, which is a society-dependent idea of gender. The reason why you even have a gender is because someone else has a different one. Notice I say you think, because you're the only person who can decide your gender or sexuality. No one else can tell you who you like or who you feel like. So when you refer to someone's sex, we're talking about whether they were born male, female, or a combination of the two, which is intersex, plain and simple biology, as opposed to their gender, which is their personal evaluation of their gender, the role or identity. So one can be cisgendered, which means your mind, your body are the same, which means you were born a man, you feel like a man, or you were born a woman, and woman will feel like a woman, or that you could be a trans person who is born with a body not in tune with their own. It could be gender fluid, non gender, and so on and so forth. Gender is a spectrum. There are a hundred stops you can make between a man and a woman. You don't necessarily have to be at one end to feel like you belong there. Sexuality is about who you like, about their bodies and identities. You can like a man or a woman or both without thinking about your own gender or body. So let me illustrate this one. Think of sex, gender, and sexuality as three independent spheres of your personality. So on the left you have your typical straight man. He's born a man, feels like a man, and is attracted to women. On the right is similarly a straight woman. When these three aspects come together, you get a certain unique combination of the three. What you see here is what a word when everyone is straight. Now let's meet, let me take this further. The upper two segments are of course still the same. But the bottom two represent what would happen when the sex and gender remain the same. But now the man is attracted to a man. The woman is attracted, attracted to a woman. Suddenly there are more colors on the board. More types of people. I could similarly change the gender identity. This also means that you can have transgender lesbians, which means someone who was born a man wants to become a woman, but continue to be with women. People can ask, why would you go through a tedious sex or gender gender change process when you're just going to end up with a woman anyway? But gender, like I said, is not about others. It's about your own identity. Transgender women don't ch change their identity because they like men. They do it because they feel like women. Similarly for transgender men. Every time I change one of these variables, I get a unique combination of what is a possible type of identity. Just because every man is a different type of man, every woman is a different type of woman. I could even add layers of uh, access, diversity. This is not a mutually exclusive set. So I can just as easily have a transgender woman who is also disabled. There's a box. But it is not one that contains these identities of alternate genders, sexualities, but it is in fact a box that contains our limited understanding of what is normal or usual. Outside of that box is the unlimited permutations and combinations of human sexual expression, which is what makes everyone so unique. So let's talk about it. According to most national surveys, the average percentage of LGBTQ population is between 7 to 15 percent. 
and I'm talking about prevalence and not density, which can vary in rural or urban settlements. The visibility can also vary depending on the acceptability in that culture. The total population of India as of 2016 was about 1.3 trillion people. Even if I apply the lowest number from the range, the number of LGBT people would be close to over 91 million people. Put that into perspective. The total population of Mumbai and Delhi combined just last year was around 40 million. I believe it was Siddhan Shah who recounted an incident on the first day of how a security guard once asked him, Bhaiya, in logo ne kaam machine nahi pehne. Kya ye sach mein hai? Identities come with expectations. Because we can't really handle diversity. We want different to also fit our parameters of it. Hey, you don't even know how to cook. Are you even a girl? Dude. Why do you like wearing pigs so much? That is so gay. There is no way you are gay. You don't even dress that well. Dude, I'm gay because I like men, not because I match my belt with my shoes. Exclusion is inherent in language. This language is filled with assumptions. Devdut Patnaik's book, Shikhandi and other tales they don't tell us. He narrates a folk retelling of the Ramayana, but upon leaving Ayodhya, the banks of a river, he says to the people of Ayodhya, who have all come following him into exile. Men and women of Ayodhya, if you truly love me, wipe your tears and return to my brother's kingdom. I have to go into exile alone. We shall meet again in 14 years. When he returned, 14 years later, he found a group of people living on the banks of the river waiting for him. When he asked them why they did not return as he had instructed, they said that they are kidnapped, neither men nor women. So when he referred to the men and women of Ayodhya, he was not speaking to them. So they did not return. They stayed back, waiting for his return. Language is filled with expectations. Words like tomboy exist only for the sole reason to tell us that a girl who has either decided to have short hair, or be interested in sports, or swear, or basically do anything that is not expected from a girl, she must be referred to differently. And I don't think I need to say anything about what men who act like women are often called. Language imposes the norm. Boys don't cry. We throw like a girl. Growing up gay, one becomes very cautious with language. Pronouns are the worst. For the first couple of years in this college, before I had come out to my friends, I had become a pro at drafting genderless sentences with a beautiful mix of Hindi, English, and Urdu, wherever necessary, describe my dating life to friends. We refer to our sexualities way more often than we care to admit. And are asked about ours way more than we'd like, but they are presented in seemingly innocuous and innocent ways. I get asked, do you have a girlfriend? Are you married? I can only choose to say no because my straightness has been assumed as a man. My answer isn't a lie. It is, however, much less than the truth. Every time you talk about your wife, husband, or child, you are at the very least talking about your straightness. And on a deconstructing level, talking about the state given right that you have as a heterosexual to be able to conveniently pick a partner, marry him, start a life together as a socially acceptable unit of life. The last time I was living with my daughter, I could at most have a rented with my The way we speak speaks for us. At 29, I hear more shadi kab karreo than I hear highs and lows. Why is my marriage certificate more important than my degree? Degree mein mein paat saal lagge. Marriage certificate to Sangeet Dalvi Fere karte hi mil jayega. I mean, I don't really have a problem with getting married, but it's not quite legal in India. Legal. Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code criminalizes non penal vaginal sex. Basically, any form of sex that isn't trying to create babies. Fun fact Section 377 applies to and criminalizes most heterosexual couples as well. So let's face it, 
but trying not to make both babies more often than they are. What LGBT people are soft targets. Because non baby making sex is the only time that is available to them. Discrimination becomes easy. But it's not just about that. Anti rape laws don't protect our children. They don't also protect men. Rape is defined as a sexual violence against women by men. So they have to continue to use Section 377 to their rapists, which just me does not have that. And is more often used as a tool to get to them instead. We certainly don't have the marriage laws. I'm not the most romantic person in the world. So I don't want to talk about how marriage is the ultimate expression of love between two people who are straight or otherwise because it's not. And honestly, everyone is better off without it. For a married couple, it enjoys a lot of baby rights, social rights. The two men and women who are living together simply cannot have an inheritance. You can have a will, but that will still be contested by family. Authorizing rights in case of medical emergencies, sharing medical covers, getting in rights to company payments. I mean, I have a hard time getting stag empty with a date on the week. Sir, the women in your club don't need protection from me. I need protection from them. Language needs to be inclusive, so that laws can be inclusive. Design needs to be inclusive, so that spaces can be inclusive. So, what we can learn. The case study uh, of the law against Dowry, and while we, laws can't change much in India when you don't have the people like it. A lot of companies now in India have started recognizing sexual orientation and gender identity in their non discrimination policies. Workplace policies are a great place for change. Better engine, I believe, is our institutions. In my five years of schooling in architecture, I have learned many things about the nature of the world. But I have learned way more about the nature of culture, of communities, and of people. I have learned the distinctions between the requirements and aspirations. And how buildings can afford more than just shelter for individuals. Give them an identity. One of the major differences between me and the students here now, just over a decade later, is all of you students here are receiving an education at the time in which mission forms and unconscious have a third box to take for gender. However, I'm not sure how many of them have gender in their bodies. Gender is a great metaphor for the future. You don't need to design the future. Three genders, or a specific gender. You just need to design for everyone, regardless of their gender. It's not special treatment, it's being treated the same. Like rats are not designed for exclusive regions. If you have a rat, you can treat for not have steps without excluding them. And even when we can build for rats, I think it's far more important to build tolerant. How does one design for a baby? Is your answer going to be design something different, specific, or something which is just the same? Whatever you choose, you will be making a statement. Because what we design has language. To someone who's battled discrimination and people, is that a feeling of loss for their gender identity at a public place? A gender neutral toilet can say, you have the freedom to choose what you say to them. But you no longer have the freedom to say that. The idea is to drop your assumptions and expectations and to expand your vocabulary. Be it the kind that you speak or the kind that you your design speak. I'd like to go back to that idea. The LGBTQ flag is an anchor. It's essentially a spectrum. The idea is to encompass all identities, and not just sexual identities, but identities in general. If you see a rainbow, you're not supposed to see seven colors, or six in this case, or 
every color imaginable. You're supposed to see everything. So when you see white, you should know that you're not seeing the absence of color. But the overwhelming, all encompassing presence of every single color imaginable. Good evening, ladies, women.